Thank you, Knox. Hello, everybody. Okay, welcome to the March meeting of the Astronomy Club of Asheville. This is my first time here and I'm glad to meet you all. And we went out to dinner this evening with a couple of the members and had a great time. Uh, so what, there's two things most people ask me when they meet me is how long you've been doing this and what got you interested. So I'm gonna get that out of the way right now. Uh, I became interested in astronomy as a child. Uh, I'm 68 years old, so that tells you guys. I, I grew up in the 50s and the 60s, and we all know what happened back then. Uh, the first and most important memory I have of being involved in science in any way, shape, or form was when the teachers in our I think it was third or fourth grade class, played uh, President Kennedy's inaugural, I don't know if it was his inaugural speech, but it was a speech where he says, we're going to go to the moon within a decade. And that just lit me up. It's like, wow, that's so cool. Uh, the other thing that really got me interested, uh, I grew up in Ohio, Northern Ohio, and about, 90 miles away from me, there was a fella named John Glenn. You all heard the name? Okay, well, uh, John Glenn was a son of a plumber, lived, like I said, about 90 miles away from me, out in rural Ohio, where there was nothing. And so when he went up and he circled the moon, it's like, well, anybody can go up and circle once. But then he circled again. It's like, well, gee, he can do it twice. Maybe this is within the realm of possibility. This is going to get us started in, in the space. And then he did it a third time. And so here I am, 60 years after that event, still just as much interested in science, technology, engineering, arts, math, all that good stuff. and. So all that stuff stuck. And that, that's what got me here and what, why I'm here to talk to you today about the James Webb Space Telescope. And as Knox alluded to, you can't really talk about the James Webb unless you talk about the Hubble too, because they're so inexorably entwined right now. And there's your logo, yay. So, as I mentioned, Dorothy and I grew up in Ohio. We lived there until we retired in 2016. And I came to North Carolina, and it's like, in Ohio, I knew hundreds and hundreds of amateur astronomers. And all of a sudden, here I am 700 miles away and don't know anybody. So, the first thing I did was join the Astronomy Club of Charlotte. Then I joined the Piedmont Amateur Astronomers because they're only like four miles away from my house. And pretty soon I had become a member of all the local astronomy clubs around me. And now I'm happy that seven years later, I know hundreds and hundreds of amateur astronomers in the Carolinas that I'm happy tonight to be, <clears throat> excuse me, meeting even more. Uh, in 2020, I was scheduled to come here and give a talk to you at, on the Parker Solar Probe, but we all know what happened in 2020. The country shut down. Uh, we were talking about doing a Zoom meeting, but that never happened. So I'm glad to be here tonight and finally get out here to meet you guys. Okay, so as I said, tonight I'm going to talk about the JWST or the James Webb, or we'll just call it the Webb, maybe. So I've seen so many images comparing the Webb images to Hubble images. And 
I don't know. I think NASA in their zeal to promote the Hubble or the web is kind of doing a little bit of a disservice to the Hubble, don't you think? You're seeing all these beautiful images and compared to this ugly looking red thing over here and it. So I even had a guy ask me, not an astronomy friend, but just a regular friend in general that knows I'm into astronomy. And he actually asked me, why'd they send that piece of crap up there? Because it takes such lousy pictures. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> That does not take crappy pictures. I mean, sure, when we sent it up, it was broken and we had to go up and fix it so it could take nice pictures. But the reason the pictures look so much different is because the telescopes are so much different. And that's what we kind of have to remember and kind of relay to the public when you hear those remarks about, gee, why is that one so ugly? Why, why does the web look so nice? And the, the bottom line, the answer is you're just not comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges. For example, would you compare a Volkswagen to a NASCAR vehicle? I mean, they both have four wheels. They have windshields and steering wheels and brakes and an accelerator, but there's no comparison. Yeah, they're both vehicles, but they're nothing alike just like the web and the hub or nothing alike. Uh, same thing with a pickup to a semi. You need to go down to Lowe's and buy a box of nails. Uh, you might wanna take this. If you need 300 sheets of plywood, maybe you better take that. I mean, there's just no comparison. And the same thing with all telescopes, actually. Uh, you can't really compare a 40, 50, 60 millimeter telescope to a eight, to an eight inch edge HD or a 36 inch dob. They're, they're all telescopes, but they all do different things and they all have different purposes. So, you know, we really need to compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges when we're talking about these telescopes. So that's gonna be the gist of my talk today. We're gonna to talk about why the two telescopes are similar as well as why they're totally different. So to answer that question, we need to kind of take a step back and go back to basics and talk about what, what is a telescope? What, uh, and how our telescope is similar to our eyes. So light from a star comes down, it strikes our eyes, which is kind of like a telescope. And the information that's picked up in our eyes is transmitted through organic wires to our central processing unit or our cerebral cortex. Uh, similarly, light from a star comes down through the optics of a telescope, hits a camera, goes through wires to a telescope. So basically our eyes and our telescopes are pretty much the same. Uh, with one big exception. Uh, the pupil in our eyes is only about seven millimeters in diameter, uh, maybe a quarter of an inch at best. So it can't gather very much light. So when we look at stars, we can only see up to about fifth magnitude. And even if we take one of them little three inch telescopes and hook a camera to it, all of a sudden we can jump up to around 17th magnitude we can see just by adding that much more aperture. Whoops, I forgot to fill that number in. Sorry. <laughs> and I don't know it off the top of my head. But here, here's a nice graphic. I really like this. Here's our quarter inch eyeball compared to the Hubble and the web. So the Hubble's eight foot in diameter. That's a lot, 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 lot bigger than our little eyeballs. So it has a lot more light gathering power. Uh, the web compared to that eight feet is a whopping 21 feet in diameter. The focal length of the Hubble is 189 feet. 
That's long. But the web is 431 feet from the primary to the secondary. Uh, the collecting area, 49 square feet for the Hubble, 273 square feet for the web. So that is a huge reason just in the diameters of these two scopes why the web can take so much brighter pictures. And there's other reasons too that we'll get into. So at this point in our discussion, our eyes, our telescopes are all pretty much the same. But the web has something special going on. There's a special feature on the web that allows us to see things that our eyes and all these other telescopes that we've discussed, the Dobbs, the uh, Edge HDs, the little three inch refractors, none of them can see what the James Webb can see. Oop, I got an empty slide. So to learn about the web's special capabilities, we kind of got to go back to basics again and talk about the electromagnetic spectrum. And as you can see here, the electromagnetic spectrum starts at 0 0.001 nanometers. Well, that's, I don't know, 100 angstroms, 1,000 angstroms. Uh, but it starts at the gamma ray end of the spectrum moves to the X-ray, and you can see the waves are getting longer, the ultraviolet, and this little colored band right here comprises everything that our conventional telescopes can see. Uh, we can't see into the infrared. We kind of can, but not very far. Uh, and it, of course, it extends on into radio waves. So the special thing that the web has is it can see beyond this. So it can see what no other telescope can see. And that's another reason why the images from the web look so much different. And pay attention, there's gonna be a test at the end. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, no tests. I hated tests when I was in school. Uh, just a side-by-side -side comparison, and they're not to scale. We'll get into that a little later, too. Uh, but one of the main goals of the web is to peer back in time, farther than any telescope's ever done in the past, to see what ancient galaxies look like and ancient what the first stars that formed in our universe, what they look like. Uh, Hubble couldn't do this because if we go back a slide, it can only see to here. It can't see over here where the everything's red shifted to the point where we can't see it. So I, I like this graphic a lot. It shows a graphical representation of the Big Bang, the Dark Age, the cosmic microwave backgrounds and any if you have an old analog tv you see that snow that's on the tv that's what the background radiation looks like but the goal of the web is to see the very first stars being formed to see the first galaxies and how they evolved over time so here's the hubble the goods chandra the deep field they're all conventional white light telescopes, so they can only see to here. To get back here, we need something different. We need to add something to the mix to get us back there. We need an infrared capable telescope, which is what the James Webb is. And in a moment, we'll talk about how it works, but like, say for example, right now, we wanna look at an object that's 
emitting light at around 590, let's just call it 600 uh, angstroms. So in a laboratory, that's where it would appear on the chart. A nearby star, because it's moving away from us, is redshifted, so it would appear over here. A nearby galaxy is going to move over here. A distant galaxy will be here, and that's about as far as we can see with our conventional telescopes. Now, you notice you come up here, and this line is shifted outside of our viewing area. We can't even see very distant galaxies with conventional telescopes. Uh, the, the glass that we use in telescopes, or if we're using Newtonians, the aluminized optics, don't pass red light very well. Uh, they're, most of them are optimized to pass in the green wavelengths. And the reason for that is our eyes are optimized to see green. We live on a green planet. Almost everything we see when we're outside is green. So our eyes are very, very sensitive to green. So it makes sense to make our telescopes sensitive in that range too. But to see over here and beyond here, again, we need something totally different. Uh, the Webb telescope, well, let's first mention the Hubble. Its mirror, almost eight foot in diameter, is a silvered mirror or luminized mirror. And those only reflect 85 to 95% of the light that strikes them. Some of it gets absorbed. The Webb, reflects 99% of the light, 4% more than this one, 14% more than that one. Uh, so it reflects a lot more light. The other thing that makes the web so unique is it's not covered with a silvered or aluminized coating, it's covered in gold. Yeah, imagine what that costs. I wanna tell you in a minute. Uh, the Webb was named after Mr. Webb, James Webb. Uh, he was one of the very first guys when NASA started back in the 50s that got the program up and running. Now, if you think about that, back in the 50s, there was no model. There was no plan for NASA. It's like, okay, I'm in charge of space. What do I do? Well, this guy did what he needed to do. Uh, he dealt with the bureaucracy, with the government to get funds. He included everyday people like us to get involved with NASA. People like me, NASA solar, solar system ambassadors. No, I don't get paid. Uh, they don't pay me to do this. I do this because I enjoy it, I guess. And I help spread the word about NASA because I think so highly of them. <clears throat> but uh, the Webb was originally named the next generation space telescope. Uh, a lot of its design came from the Hubble. Once we got the Hubble up into space and started using it, we realized that, well, gee, it does a lot of nice stuff, but it has limitations. We can't see that redshifted stuff. Uh, the mirror is not really that big. We need a much bigger mirror and a different kind of mirror to see further back in time. Uh, and somewhere along the way, the name got changed from the Next Generation Space Telescope to the James Webb. I kind of wish they'd left it the next generation because that's what it is, really. And they already have plans. They're looking at 30 years from now releasing the next generation space telescope, which will be based on what we find as flaws or shortcomings in the web telescope. Well, it was launched on Christmas Day in 2021, 7.20 a.m. 
you've probably all heard it was way, way, way over budget. It was way, way, way long overdue before they launched it. And it ended up costing $10 billion to build. Uh, it's a lot of money. I know. I would settle for one one thousandth of that. Uh, I was launched from Guiana Space Center. Was manufactured by Northrop Gun Grun <clears throat> Northrop Grumman Ball Aerospace Technologies. Uh, partners were the European Space Agency NASA and the Canadian Space Agency. <clears throat> Okay, so several innovative technologies have been developed for the web. Uh, one of the main things is a primary mirror that is constructed of 18 smaller mirrors. And through the use of artificial intelligence and a lot of little micro servers and things that we have that we didn't have 30 years ago, they're able to take these 18 mirrors up into space and move each one like to microns. They can move them within microns of each other and line everything up. So it acts as one solid cohesive mirror. They're made of beryllium uh, to make a glass mirror that size wouldn't work. It would be too heavy. We we couldn't get it off the launch pad. It would be so heavy. This beryllium, from what I've heard, and I'm not a nuclear scientist or nothing, I don't know, but what I've read is that it has it's lighter than aluminum with the strength almost of steel. So that's pretty incredible. It's strong, durable, and light. And that's another reason we sent the Hubble up 30 years ago instead of the web. We just didn't have the technology then that we have today. Uh, the biggest feature on the web is the tennis court sized five layer sun shield. And this is it here. This is it here. There's a side view. So how many of you ever seen one of these? You shine a light on it and it starts to spin. Well, okay, it's slowly starting. Can you see it? Okay, so one side's black, one side's white. When you shine a light, the black side absorbs heat, creates a high pressure layer on the black side. The white side reflects heat. So you get a low pressure system. So when you got a low pressure system on one side, a high pressure, it makes it spin. And that's the concept that this heat shield was designed on. That, so they place this shield so it's facing the sun. So the sunlight comes up and hits this black side. This side's white. And this side absorbs the heat and it gets transmitted through this and it, it lessens the amount of heat that's reaching the scope. Uh, one thing that's very important in infrared astronomy is you need very, very low temperatures. I'm talking like as a beginning point, 370 degrees minus and below. Uh, a lot of the equipment operates at 50 degrees Kelvin, which is absolute zero. Some go all the way down to five Kelvin. Uh, it's really, really, these, the sensors on here, and we'll talk about them in a minute, they really need to be kept super, super cold. So another big difference between the Hubble and the web. The Hubble was sent up 
in a rocket and placed in low Earth orbit where it remains today. It's up there just circling round and round the Earth. Since the web needs them cold, cold temperatures, you can't place it near a planet. Our planet is radiating heat out into space. You ever heard that, oh, it's going to be clear tonight, the temperature is going to drop because all that heat's going to radiate out into space. So they need to move this thing away from the Earth, away from the sun. So they selected a Lagrange two point, which is a point one and a half million miles away from the earth and the sun and it's as far away from everything as it could be but it's in a stationary point where gravity from the earth and the sun and the planets kind of isn't excuse me null it can they can put it there and unless something enters that sphere of influence it'll stay there forever so they had to put it there and they had to put it there okay when they sent it up i got a this is not the rocket that took the web into space. This is the one that took the Parker Solar Probe. All of that equipment, which is 70 feet long, 40 feet wide, and 40 feet tall, had to fit inside this fairing, which is 15 feet by 50 feet. So it all had to fit in there. So in order to do that, they had to fold it up like an accordion. And then instead of sending it to low Earth orbit, where if something went wrong when we were trying to unfold it, we could send an astronaut up there to fix it. It's a million and a half miles away. If we send it out there and then try to open it and something doesn't work, that's 10 billion bucks. That it, it's just gone. It's down the tubes, wasted. So they put a lot of redundancy into building this scope. And I, for one, am very impressed. I mean, you look at the complexity of that thing, those 18 mirrors, that big boom that's stretched out 400 feet in front of this, and all this, all this is all rolled up in a little ball and has to be unfolded a million and a half miles away. That's, that's kind of crazy, isn't it? But that's, that's what NASA does. That's rocket science right there, folks. Uh, again, just another comparison image. And you can see here in, in visible light and conventional white light, you have a lot of dust and stuff up there. And whatever's behind that dust, other than the very most extreme brightest stars, you can't see. But with the web being able to look at the Older features, it it can it doesn't really see the dust. It sees through it, and you can see all the stuff back there behind it. So it's not this image is better than this image. This is a different type of image. That's all. Okay, a lot of this we can read right off the slide. Uh, the the web mirrors twenty one feet in diameter approximately. Uh, the clear aperture is 25 square meters. Focal length's 131 meters. Uh, there's 18 segments. And this one really excites me. I don't know how many of you guys are into astrophotography out there, but the optical resolution of this telescope is 0.1 arc seconds. Uh, that's that's incredible. None of the telescopes I own at home can see that fine. Well, maybe they could, except we have an atmosphere we're looking through. So, but uh, operating temperature, as I mentioned earlier, is 50 degrees Kelvin or minus 370 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the thickness of the gold coating, and this this is what really blew my mind. Uh, I can't really read that, but I think you can. So to cover that mirror at 25 square meters, uh, if you take the density of gold at room temperature, which is 19.3 grams per cubic centimeter, you would have to use 48.25 grams of gold. 
which is about equal to the mass of a golf ball. That's how, that's how much gold they use, a golf ball. Uh, so if gold weighs, or if gold is worth $60 a gram, and they use 48.25 grams, it costs slightly under, who's good at math? 3,000 bucks, uh, $2,895 to be exact. Now we've all heard stories about how NASA bought a hammer and it cost $10,000. Uh, I'm wondering if they paid, <laughs> you know, $60 a gram for this stuff or, if they did $2,800, that's probably the cheapest thing on that entire telescope, if you think about it. Yes, that was the easy part. Uh, hey, there's basically four instruments on the scope. Uh, the first one, uh, the near cam, we'll talk about. NIR cam, which is near infrared camera. Uh, that's the primary imager, and that's will cover wavelength ranges from 0.6 to 5 microns, which is very, very small. Uh, I have an electric focuser on my telescope, and the smallest it'll even move the focuser is 3 microns. So that's pretty incredible that they can do that from a million miles away. Uh, the near cam is going to be able to detect light from the earliest stars and galaxies in the process of formation. Uh, it's also going to be good at looking at new stars in the Milky Way and at Kuiper Belt objects. It's equipped with a coronagraph. Uh, does everybody know what a coronagraph is? Okay, so basically... Chronographs historically are used to look at the sun. And if you want to see prominences on the sun, a coronagraph is a special telescope with a central obstruction in it that you can move in and out to exactly match the diameter of the sun and block the sun's light. So you can only see the prominences around the edge. Now, the problem with chronographs is they only work in very thin atmosphere. So the only chronographs you're ever going to find out about on this planet are way up on mountaintops where there's real thin atmosphere and the light doesn't get uh, just bounced around so much. But this thing being out in space, it can do that. So... That's going to be very useful in looking for planets around other suns. If you can take that thing and adjust it to the size of that sun, you're going to be able to see anything that's floating around it. When you mentioned the sun, you say some of the most spectacular sunsets I've ever seen. Well, thank you, Frank. I try. Well, Thank you. My, uh, so most people that do solar imaging shoot at F30 of around three, 4,000 millimeters focal length to get the fine resolution that Frank's talking about. I build a telescope that will give me F40 or almost 6,000 millimeters focal length. And that gives me pretty high resolution on the sun. So if they look nice, Frank, that's why. Thank you. Okay. Webb also has a cryo cooler. Uh, Again, this stuff needs to work at very, very low operating temperatures. So even with that big giant sun shield they have, just the electronics inside the unit are generating heat. So it's got coolers actually built in to the cameras 
uh, to keep them down in the range where they can work well. Uh, the next instrument is the mid infrared imager. And I believe that's it there. I think that's just a piece of it. Uh, Miri covers the wavelength range from five to 28 microns. Uh, and it's, that's the thing that's gonna be used primarily for the very redshifted light at distant galaxies. There's also a spectrograph built into that unit, which can break light down into its components and allow us to do chemical analyses of ancient galaxies to see if there was any kind of different stuff going on way back then. And the fourth instrument is called the Fine Guidance Sensor Near Infrared Imager and Slitless Spectrograph. Or you know how NASA likes It's called the FGS NIRISS. Uh, we'll, we'll just call it the guider relay. And basically, this is what they're using to guide the scope and to point the scope. So, the first thing they have to do is find an object by pointing the scope to it. And once they get that object, they need that camera to follow that object. Now, I've asked people on I haven't been able to get a good answer yet. Whether the whole entire telescope moves or when they point this thing, do they just have something in there on a little gimbal that moves to keep that object centered? I would think it'd be a lot easier to do it that way than to move this big 70 foot long telescope. But I haven't gotten an answer back yet, so. So the, this is what I was talking about earlier. Here's, there's the mirror and look at these people. So that gives you an idea. Here's the entire telescope and here's some people. This is a mock-up. But this kind of shows how the telescope looked inside that fairing sitting on the top of a rocket. And of course, as soon as it, as soon as it got into space and the fairing opened, they started moving things. They didn't wait until it got a million and a half miles away to start opening stuff up, just in case there was a problem. So guys, the next time you see a Hubble web comparison image, please remember what you learned here today. Know that the images are different because they're different types of telescopes and they do different things and they both have their good points and they both have their bad points. Uh, also remember that without the Hubble, we wouldn't know how to build this telescope. We wouldn't know what we needed. Uh, this, the Hubble is what went up there and performed well for 30 years and allowed us to start thinking about what do we need to do next to improve on the Hubble. And the web is the result. So thank you, Hubble. No, when, uh, you said something earlier in the program that really caught my imagination. You were talking about these telescopes with these bright colored images. This is my theory. The human eye is like a uh, movie camera. What your eyes are adapted to the dark, it's, you see the same thing. You watch it in the sky. I saw a few minutes for a few hours. But with a telescope, you can accumulate light. Yes. And, uh, and that's the purpose of a telescope to gather light. Travel to it. And then what I said, I take a lot of solar pictures during church. This is so I can write, tell us declare the glory of God on them. Okay, so the next question I get asked, Hubble's been up there over 30 years, I think it's 33 years now. We got the James Webb in place, what's going to happen to the Hubble? One big concern 
The Hubble's 33 years old. How many folks in this room have a car that's 33 years old? Oh, I thought there'd at least be one or two. Okay, there we go. Things break down when they get old. You don't know. Hubble could have a catastrophic failure tomorrow and be done. But we all saw what happened to Perse Perseverance. Was that his name up on Mars? He was scheduled to last a year, and he's been going strong for a long, long time. Uh, same thing could happen with the Hubble. It could stay up there for a long time with a caveat. Uh, we're approaching solar maximum right now. And as we approach solar maximum, activity from the sun increases. The solar wind gets stronger. And when the solar wind gets to our planet, it sort of intensifies our D layer in our upper atmosphere. And it's dragging the Hubble down. They're saying if nothing's done within by 2015, 2016, it could fall back to Earth. There, we have no method of moving it. We used to go up and send astronauts up with little rockets and they would move it. Uh, Elon Musk has volunteered. He said, I will build you a rocket and I'll take it up there on one of my ships and I'll attach it to the Hubble and it can stay up there indefinitely. So that's in the works. It hasn't happened yet. We don't know if it will, but there's at least a discussion going on. Um, another thing that is really interesting, and some scientists from around the world have been talking about the Hubble can see slightly into the ultraviolet range of the spectrum. That, you know, we're mostly talking with the web, we're talking about the red end. Hubble can see a little bit into the blue. When to the blue, that's mostly where stars are forming. So it's like, hey, why don't we use this to look at young stars? Something we've never done. We've just used the entire spectrum of the scope to see what's out there. Now let's, now they're thinking, well, let's just go over to the blue end and do some imaging there and compare it to the red imaging that the web is doing. So there's a good possibility the Hubble might stay up there for a while. Yeah. Well, solar maximum is in 20, oh, I said 2015, I think. Oh, sorry, 2025 is solar maximum. And if any of you guys follow, so, follow solar activity, uh, we are, let's say we have a chart that starts here and ends here. And the predictions say that right now, the sunspot level should be here. It's here. The peak is there. So where we're supposed to be at in 2025, we're already there. So they're saying this, this solar cycle, cycle 25, could be extremely high and cause a lot of problems with space satellites. Uh, there could be a lot of stuff coming out of the sky in the next few years. But a lot of those satellites do have methods of correcting their velocities and their trajectories. So, yes, sir. They could probably do that. If they put this rocket motor on, that would be within the realm of possibility. But I, as of yet, I haven't heard anybody talking about that. Uh, from what I've heard, they just want to put a small system of gyros and servos and a little bit of rocket fuel or something, just enough to keep it stable in its orbit around Earth. 
Uh, they don't want to invest a whole lot of money because, like I said, it's 33 years old and it could break any time. So, yes. Uh, from what I understand, L2 is a specific spot in space where the gravity from everything in the solar system is stationary and it's put there and it's not moving from what I understand. Okay, I wasn't aware. I thought it was just put in the center of it and it just hung there. Okay, so it's orbiting that, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, see, I'm, gl I'm glad I came here tonight. I'm learning stuff too, so that's great, thank you. Yeah. 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 And the other thing I didn't mention, the reason they're looking at doing ultraviolet with the Hubble, uh, the D layer in our atmosphere, the ionization layer, absorbs all the ultraviolet light that's coming toward the Earth. So our Earthbound telescopes can't see the ultraviolet light. So it's good to have something outside the orbit that can see it. So that's another big selling point for keeping the Hubble alive. Okay, so one last time, I'll say it again. Next time you see a Hubble web comparison image, don't compare them to see which is better or worse. Compare them to see what the differences are and why. And that'll go a lot further toward our entire understanding of the capabilities of the two scopes and of the universe that we are living in and trying to observe. I think I showed one similar to this earlier where you can actually see through a lot of the dust and debris that's up there and actually see the stuff that we want to see that's behind it. And it opens up a whole new avid, new study. I can. That that's molecular hydrogen, helium, dust, dirt, little pieces of rocks. That's just sort of hanging so a, a lot of us i i myself included at one time thought that what we see up there is what's been up there forever the stars that we're seeing right there this is like a stellar nursery these stars are all new uh all this all this stuff is where prior stars have been and they've exploded and left debris behind and the new stars you can see where they're at. They're all right in the densest part of these clouds where they're for, new stars are forming out of the old stars. So that, that's pretty cool. Yes. Yeah, this one by the Hubble, this one by the web. Yes, yes. And you can see this bright feature right here. There it is right there. This one, you can see right here. And even these stars. Uh, and again, it, it's just another image, what you see in white light, what you see in infrared.
So you can see there's a lot more reddish details here that are obscured by dust lanes, et cetera. Yes, Say, same here. This is the Hubble, this is the web. No, no, and this isn't what the raw image looks like either. Um, when they first sent the Hubble up and started taking pictures, it's actually taking pictures in black and white. They both are. Uh, and they develop what they called the Hubble palette. I'm sure some of you guys have heard of that. Uh, I use it in my astrophotography. Uh, I can tell my camera, use this much for red, this much for green, this much for blue, and use red, green, and blue filters and apply those numbers. And I can make an image that looks just like this one using the Hubble palette. I'm sure Webb has a palette. I really haven't heard much about it yet, uh, but I'm sure they're using one. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so we talked a little bit about how long the Hubble's going to last. And people are beginning to question how long is the web going to last? Uh, the web has already taken seven, <clears throat> 17 micro meteoroid, meteorite hits on its mirror. So there are 17 little spots. Fortunately, they're all small enough that they have very little or negligible effects. Uh, for those of you that do astroimaging, you know you can take a, if you've got a bad pixel in your camera, you can tell it, delete that pixel and compare it to the pixels around it and merge the information together and come up with a replacement value. That's what they're doing with these 17 little itty bitty tiny holes in the mirror. Uh, let's see, when was it? Last, I, oh, last June, a big micrometeorite hit one of the mirrors, and you can see that there. So they, they have a diagnos diagnostic test kit on the scope, and they can look at the mirrors and make sure they're all aligned and they don't have any damage or dirt on them or anything and they took this picture and released it in june of last year and you can see where that micrometeorite hit that mirror and it's affecting the light path number one when it hit it moved that mirror but fortunately they had the little gimbals and little arms up there and they moved it back but that one spot isn't reflecting light anymore so they're pretty certain there's a chunk missing out of that mirror but that just goes to show you that telescope could be up there for a hundred years it could take a big hit tomorrow and put it entirely out of service it could just destroy that mirror so you never know uh, all we can do is hope for the best <laughs> So that, that concludes my presentation for tonight. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about me and the other presentations I have, uh, go to ncstargazer.com. That's my webpage. And it's got my presentations, my articles, my videos. I have a YouTube channel. Uh, all my articles are on there. My weather station's on there, uh, my observatory. Uh, my Comet website, I'm fortunate to be 68 years old, and I've observed over 60 comets in my lifetime. So I'm pretty proud of that. And most of them I have pictures of, and they're on that website. So, mm -hmm.
Yeah. Not yet. Uh, they're still doing a lot of analyzing images and data. Uh, the goal, of course, is to take the Hubble images where we know this is what galaxies look like in recent times. Now, what did they look like when they were forming? And let's compare the two. And then we can look at local galaxies and say, this is what they look like now. The Hubble, this is what they look like then. And the web, this is what they look like way back. So we can kind of get like a picture of a human. Here they were as a five-year-old. Here they were as a young adult. And here they were as an elderly gentleman. So you can kind of see the timeline. And that's the goal of this. But so far, I haven't really seen a lot of the comparisons yet. Uh, the, the main thing that you have to think about is this thing's up there shooting 24 seven. It's taking millions, maybe billions of pictures. And then each one of those has to go before a text sitting at a computer and they have to analyze it and get the right values and numbers to make that an image. Cause you know, that, that camera is just sending back zeros and ones. And then we're converting that into data. And that all takes time. So when you got billions coming at you, you can't keep up. So I'm guessing in a year, they're probably only through the first month's worth of data by now. <laughs> you know, you know, you notice they don't send pictures out every single day. They send out like one or two a month. Uh, so it's it's a time painstaking process. So I I would suspect soon we're going to hear something, but. We haven't yet. So uh, thank you guys for inviting me to present to the group. And hopefully you'll ask me back in the future. I have lots and lots of more programs. And now I'll entertain some questions. Yes, sir. They, I don't think they've, they haven't found the aha moment yet. They have found conclusively that they are seeing much, much more than the Hubble did. So we know that part of the program and the technology is working. But as far as finding that thing that says, oh my gosh, there's the very first galaxy that was ever formed, that they haven't gotten there yet. Sure, sure. Uh, I have a lot of respect for the people at NASA. I mean, they are true rocket scientists and they build so much redundancy into everything. So if they try something and it doesn't work, they have something else they can try and something else they can try. And I'm sure they've tried all this stuff and they're, I'm sure they have found ways already to improve. Uh, as, as I said, they're, they're already looking into the next generation telescope that's right now is scheduled for launch in 2054, I believe. So I'm sure any improvements they find here will go into that one. Yes, sir. Thank you, I thought the same thing. 17 times in a year in this case, but the fortunately the 17 that hit really have no consequence. Uh, they're so minor, they're so small. I mean, these are like grains of sand striking it. So if they're leaving a hole, it's a grain of sand size or maybe a little larger and it's not doing a lot of damage. But the big one, that's the one that concerns me. If that happened, well, it went up in December and got hit in June. 
that's that's scary because you get three or four more of those they can shut the thing down so yeah so yes it is yes sir there's a lot of telescopes people can buy time on it or different institutions can go tonight we pointed here is this how this works or is nasa the sole director of what they're looking for or at great question uh there is a huge collaboration around the world uh canadian space agencies involved in this european space agency plus nasa and they're all working together and from what i understand in addition to those three there's hundreds of universities that this stuff is going to also so it's getting a lot of coverage but again there's so much coming in it's just taking time for them to analyze stuff yes sir Oh, that's cool. Well, if they're going to hit, I'd rather they hit the back of the mirror than the front, right? <laughs> wow. Okay, yeah. Okay, yes, ma'am. Okay. No, that's that's fine. That's a good question. Uh, that's part of it. So light travels at 186,000 miles per second. So that's like five, almost six trillion miles a year. So the nearest star to us is Alpha Centauri and it's four light years away. So that means when we look at that, we're looking at it, let's see, five trillion times four, that's 20 trillion years ago. Yeah, thank you, yeah. 20 trillion miles, but we're seeing it as it looked. So light moving at 186,000 miles, five years ago left, and it's taking it five years to get here. So essentially, when we see that light, we're seeing that light as it looked five years ago. So we're looking into the past. That don't make sense? Oh, okay. So that's how the Webb telescope is able to see further into the past. Number one, it's bigger. It's coated in gold, so it's bigger and collects more light. But number two, it's able to see that light as that light, that five-year light, it's redshifting it. Do you know what redshifting means? Okay, then that's not a good explanation then. Uh, okay, I, I'm not sure if I can find that, but uh, so you ever been sitting at it? Yes. You ever been sitting at a railroad crossing and a train goes by and they're blowing their horn? And it gets louder and louder and louder and louder and all of a sudden quieter and quieter and quieter. As that 
train is moving for you, it's siren, the waves are piling up. So it like emits a wave here and then it moves and then it emits another, and they're starting to catch up with each other. So the waves get louder and louder and louder. As Soon as it goes by you, now the waves are coming further apart. So the tone drops and gets lower. The same thing happens with light. When an object's moving toward you, the light shifts to the blue end of the spectrum. If it's something that's moving away from you or you're moving away from it, it shifts to the red. So those early, early, early galaxies are so many millions of light years away that their light, they're receding from us and their light is stretching out and getting dimmer. And we can only see it in the red portion of the spectrum. Yes, yes. And infrared, you ever seen these uh, OB movie dramas? Uh, the bad guys run, or the good guys running from the bad guy, the bad guys shooting at him, and the good guys shooting back. And he's running and he runs out of bullets. So he says, Well, I'll just tuck down into this basement down here. And it's pitch black down there. He ain't gonna be able to see me. So the bad guy goes down, the good guy goes in the basement, the bad guy follows him, but he's got a set of infrared goggles. So he puts them on. Now he can see in the dark. So what's the good guy do? Pulls out his trusty flashlight and shines it into the eyes of the infrared glasses. And a guy screams and rips his glasses off. And now he can't see nothing either. So the good guy jumps him, takes his gun, shoots him, and gets away. It's kind of the same thing here. Uh, <laughs> you can't operate an infrared telescope in bright light. It has to be out there in the dark. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, did I answer your question? Okay, thank you. Thank you.